Washington Metro is an architectural masterpiece. Its brutalist underground stations are iconic, with vaulted concrete ceilings and dramatic indirect lighting. Its signature look comes from a standard set of materials and architectural forms, which are consistently applied to a wide variety of station designs. There are actually 11 distinct types of stations on the Metro Rail network, and a few unique ones. But first, to understand why the Washington Metro looks like it does, we need to go back to the very beginning. When Metro received its funding in the 1960s from President Lyndon B. Johnson, architect Harry Weiss toured several great Metro systems all over the world to come up with an iconic visual aesthetic for DC. After a few iterations, he and his team settled on a modernist design with coffered ceiling vaults inspired by DC's neoclassical architecture. Weiss would later team up with designer Massimo Vignelli to develop the system's logos and signage. Since Weiss wanted the platforms to be open with little obstruction, Vignelli created square posts that sit on the platforms instead of relying on cluttered overhead signs. When this standard station design matured, architects created a 17-foot sample section in 1968 to test construction methods and give the public a view of what was to come. This provided valuable lessons to architects and engineers working on the system. The Washington Metro would open to the public on March 27, 1976 with only five stations, but several more opened soon after. In the following decades, Metro would expand across D.C. and into the suburbs of Maryland and Virginia. A variety of different designs began to appear as Metro built its current 97 stations. To make sense of it all, urban planner Matt Johnson has done the hard work of identifying 11 common station designs. Waffle, Arch 1, Arch 2, Twin Tube, Goal 1, General Peak, High Peak, Alexandria Peak, Gull 2, Gambrel, and Tyson's Peak. The most common is the Waffle Style Station, which was the original design envisioned by Harry Weiss. It features rectangular coffers, which were typically constructed using a cast-in-place method. Navy Yard is an example of this type of station in its purest form. There are 32 Waffle Stations in the system, with a few notable variations. Pentagon and Rosslyn have tracks on separate levels because of nearby track junctions. Three stations built in the Waffle style are multi-level junctions where two or more lines meet, L'Enfant Plaza, Chinatown Gallery Place, and Metro Center. The scale of these stations is truly impressive since the intersecting vaults open up so much space underground. Chinatown Gallery Place has a particularly spectacular vantage point, where you can see almost an entire circumference of the vaulted barrel section unobstructed. The next station designs are called Arch 1 and Arch 2. They are simplified versions of the Waffle Stations, and used precast sections to cut construction costs. Arch 1 stations have two coffers on each half of the vault, while Arch 2 stations have three. Arch 1 is only found on the red line, while Arch 2 is only found on the green and yellow lines. When the eastern section of the red line extended north, extra deep tunneling was required for geotechnical reasons. To keep costs reasonable at such depths, the twin tube station design was used for Wheaton and Forest Glen. These are the least spacious of any of the underground stations. Due to the depth, Wheaton features the longest escalators in the Western Hemisphere, and Forest Glen employs high-speed elevators with no escalators at all. While the four underground station designs might be the most recognizable, Metro has seven above-ground station designs, with the original being called Gull 1. It features a gull-shaped canopy made of exposed concrete. This was one of Harry Weiss's original designs, and one of these stations was built for Metro's 1976 opening. There are 15 gull stations in total. Most are island platforms with a canopy in the center, though there are a few side platform examples, like Eisenhower Avenue and Cheverly. In the 80s and 90s, Metro shifted to a different design for above-ground stations, called General Peak, which appeared 11 times. A variation of the general peak is the high peak, which elevates a similar canopy high above the platform and mezzanine. In Virginia, two stations use a special canopy style to better fit in with the architecture of Old Town Alexandria. This style is the Alexandria peak. There are three stations with a variation on the original Gull design, called Gull 2. They're much newer than the original Gull 1 stations and were built in the 2000s. 
They have a sleek, white canopy that marked the first major departure from Harry Weiss's brutalist modernism, and marked the end of Metro's use of Vignelli's wayfinding posts on the platforms. But the signature hexagonal tiled flooring remains the same. On the Silver Line extension in Virginia, which is the newest part of the Metro system, nearly all the stations feature a lightened metallic vaulted canopy. These are called gambrel stations, named after the gambrel roof, which is found in Dutch colonial homes and barns. On the inside, they look sort of like the original vaulted underground stations. Also, the floor tiles are different and are made from larger precast sections instead of the older glazed terracotta tiles. Two of the Silver Line stations, Spring Hill and McLean, use a style called Tyson's Peak, named for both stations proximity to Tyson's Virginia. They have a light and sleek aesthetic like the rest of the new Silver Line stations, but use a canopy style reminiscent of General Peak and Alexandria Peak. So those are all 11 types of stations, but Metro actually has 8 unique stations with styles that don't appear more than once on the system. Anacostia features a unique transverse arch pattern due to the fact it was built just below ground level. Huntington is unique because its platforms and parking garage are built into a steep hill. It even features an inclined elevator. Arlington Cemetery has a simple side platform design where the Memorial Avenue overpass covers most of the platform. Hyattsville Crossing, formerly Prince George's Plaza, was built in a large open cut and has a parking garage and bus terminal above the platforms. This gives it an imposing, fortress-like look. West Hyattsville opened the same time as Hyattsville Crossing. It is similarly boxy with tons of exposed concrete, but looks simple and modern since the canopy is less busy. Both of Metro's airport stops are unique. Dulles Airport has a minimalist canopy that is a subtle nod to Aero Saarinen's modernist terminal design. Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport Station has two different types of canopies. One is from the station's original construction overseen by Harry Weiss in the 70s, and is a modified version of the Gull 1 design. The other part came from a later renovation, which attempts to blend in with Caesar Pelli's 1997 terminal design. Last but not least, Fort Totten combines elements of Gull 1 and Twin Tube in a creative way. The lower level is partially underground due to the topography, so the platform transitions between an exposed section with a canopy to a completely covered underground station. In the near future, Metro will soon open one more unique station, Potomac Yard. This will help riders access the new Potomac Yard mixed-use development in Virginia. Over the years, Metro has done a fairly good job keeping their stations clean and free from graffiti, and has made some quality of life upgrades like canopies over station entrances to keep rain from breaking the escalators. But it's important to mention that a few Waffle stations have received a much more controversial renovation. In the 90s, seven stations had their concrete painted to brighten the platforms and cover concrete damage, including Archives Navy Memorial Penn Quarter. This upset architects and preservationists because it was so disruptive to the original feel of the stations as imagined by Harry Weiss, and the paint cannot be easily removed. The comfort of passengers is important, but the stations could have been brightened with better lighting or simply by keeping the bare concrete clean. Metro would do this again when they painted Union Station in 2017 and received a similar response. It was particularly jarring when the primer coat was applied, which eliminated the contrast in the coffers that comes from the station's dramatic lighting. Further coats of paint brought the station closer to its original finish, but it still doesn't look the same as the original bare concrete. While it's sad to see some stations lose their original look and feel, it's really not a huge deal. And overall, Metro has preserved the look and feel of its stations very well. And while the newer stations on the network look quite different from Weiss's original designs, there's still a profound sense of uniformity throughout the network. While the United States is not a nation that prioritizes high-quality public transit, DC's Metro offers a glimpse of what can be accomplished with good planning and sufficient funding. Very few stations feel crowded or underbuilt. Transfers in the core of the network are easy because of the thoughtful station designs. The network currently carries about 300,000 riders per day, but can easily handle over a million. Despite its challenges, 
the Washington Metro is a truly impressive system with timeless architecture that will faithfully serve the DC metro area for years to come.